talking about super conferences, and I'm not even so sure I've come to terms with the Pac-12 being dead just yet. Welcome into the Hard Count. It is Thursday, April 4th, 2024, the last one on the face of the planet. Hey, we're glad y'all are here. We're grateful y'all are here. We appreciate that y'all honor college football as a year-round sport because it very much so is. We got some rumblings as of last night. The Athletic putting out an article. I saw it from Stuart Mandel, the super conference was proposed from 20 different sports execs. What do we think about that? Is that a good idea? Because some people might say, well, hey, college football is changing regardless. The tectonic plates are shifting. The old way is done. What's this new way going to be? We might as well jump on board. We'll talk about that. We got our thoughts here for you in a matter of minutes. Speaking of intrigue, speaking of interesting, who are the most interesting teams in the world? And maybe when we talk about the world, we're talking about the college football world. I've got a list of four to five teams that I want us to unpack together because as interesting as this season can be, I think the storylines for some specific teams, hint, hint, some specific teams moving into new conferences may very well uh, have a high impact year for them. Also, the transfer portal about to open up here in a matter of days. What can you expect, one, from the operation behind the transfer portal? And second, Let's just call our shot here. Like, we, we're, we're a few days out from this thing. Let's kind of take our swing at what we think some specific teams might end up doing. A lot of talk around Auburn and their quarterback position. A lot of talk around Michigan and their quarterback room. What's LSU going to do? What about Bama? We got some thoughts there. We'll talk about it here in a matter of just a few minutes. Also, who are the most dangerous defenses in college football heading into 2024? We talked about the offensive side of the ball a few weeks ago. We'll show some love to the defense. It's a great day to be alive, man. We're glad y'all are here. Biggest Thursday of the week. Let's jump right in. The Super Conference era is not necessarily on the horizon, but it's starting to be floated, starting to be proposed. And there's an article that came out yesterday from The Athletic. Uh, I saw it from Stuart Mandel that a group of 20 sports executives are proposing an 80-team college football Super League with some promotion, some relegation for those of y'all that are European soccer fans. For those of y'all that don't love the NCAA, I'm right there with you. This would essentially ice that whole operation out of there. Also, it would be a way to pay players directly. The, the whole pitch is for a healthier college football. Sounds pretty good, right? We're managing the transfer portal. Uh, transfer portal. We're helping regulate NIL. We're doing a lot of things here that, in theory, are fixing problems within college football. Okay, so with that being said, is this a good idea? Is this going to happen? Is this gaining traction? The article goes much more in depth into all of those questions, but I want to answer them from a, a short-term perspective, and I also want us to give you our thoughts on that as well. So before we get to that, make sure you're subscribed. If you're watching Live in Living Time, we appreciate you for that. We appreciate you being a part of this program. Make sure you are tuned in to the nth degree because we're live now three times a week. If you're listening on podcasts or you're watching on, on a one-off video, we appreciate you too. But getting in the live chat here during our live show is the best way to interact with us in real time. So thank you for that. Thank you for being subscribed. All right, as I was saying, the pitch is for a healthier and fixed college football. Going back to the structure, the pitch is 80 teams. 70 of those teams, though, are perpetually a part of that league. Okay, so there's no promotion and relegation for 70 teams. However, there is another division within this league of 50 plus teams and those 50 plus teams are competing for 10 other spots to be in that 80 team super league so i'm imagining we're somewhere in the range of those big brands the secs the big tens whoever else are probably filling in the blanks there in that 70 team league as the consistent staples there and then the other 10 you're probably looking at your g5s your you know your your mountain west maybe your smaller power five as it used to be kind of schools that's the pitch right now Again, the pitch is for healthier college football. We're managing transfer portal and NIL. We're paying players directly. But here's the thing, man. This, As I read through this article, the personnel involved with this started to set off a bit of an alarm for me in my mind. Because you start reading through this 20 sports executives, and it sounds like they have their heart in the right place. But you hear where they come from, from a professional standpoint. Hey, this guy was Roger Goodell's right-hand man. This guy was in the MLS. This guy was in the Premier League. This guy worked with this professional team. And I appreciate the fact that they are, you know, goats at their craft, I'm sure, for them to be able to put something like this together. I'm sure they obviously have some credentials to make a proposal like this. But it continued to set off that alarm of like, hey, 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 we got a lot of people involved with other pro sports leagues that are trying to professionalize college football. Now you're saying, J.D., college football is already professional, isn't it? I mean, we got guys being paid. 
We got the tectonic plate shifting because of TV money within the conferences. Like, it's already sort of professional, isn't it? Yes, but at the same time, college football, from where I'm sitting, is still very much so the college football that we've come to know and love. Like, fall Saturdays are still collegiate. They still have, you know, the, the, the same feel to them during that, you know, stretch from August through November. Like, there's still a very much so college football feel to it. And I think the conferences have a lot to do with that. But you make it an 80-team Super League, I don't know that it would be quite as recognizable as, as what we see right now in college football. And so the best way I can describe this is I think college football is a national park, a couple of problems. Maybe the roads aren't paved as nicely as they need to be for folks to operate. Maybe there's some issues with some things overgrown that make it, you know, not, not necessarily the, the beautiful thing that it once was. But when a national park has issues, the solution is not to build a theme park on top of it. Everyone says, well, hey, don't you like roller coasters? I love roller coasters. I love the NFL. I'll watch the NBA during the playoffs. I think those are great things. But those things pale in comparison, in my opinion, to the beautiful thing that college football is. I think folks that love the Grand Canyon would say the same thing. Yeah, I like Six Flags. I don't want to ride Goliath, the roller coaster, when I go to the Grand Canyon. People say, well, there's so much money to be made. Maybe so. But I think the product that college football is has built up a following and a fan base and an audience that is specific to college football. Okay, like people that go to the Grand Canyon go there because they love the Grand Canyon. People that watch college football and go to those games do so because they've loved and enjoyed the sport for the entirety of their existence. So you don't put a roller coaster there and expect to have the same audience for what the Grand Canyon has come to be. So when I look at this thing long term, that to me sets off the alarms. We've got a lot of folks that are involved in the professional sports world trying to get something together with college football. Again, I think the heart's in the right place. I think they're trying to do a good thing. But to me, this uh, feels a little bit fishy. Not, not a big fan of the way this whole thing would trend. And I think it would, again, become more and more of a thing where college football becomes less and less recognizable. Now, this is going to happen soon. The athletic breaks it down in a lot more depth. But to put it briefly, not a whole lot of traction right now. It's, uh, it's a possibility. But the, the big roadblock here is the TV deals that are in place. A lot of those go through 2030. We're into the 2030s. And so with that being said, you would have to buy out those TV contracts if you're these 20 sports executives and everyone involved with this to be able to make it a reality. So at the end of the day, Super Conference era, is it coming? There's some rumblings about it. There's some real plans in place to try and make a, a run at it. But for me... Let's keep our national parks our national parks. Let's keep our theme parks our theme parks. And let's not try and put a roller coaster in Yosemite. We love Yosemite because it's Yosemite, not because it has roller coasters there. Yes, there may be some money to be made there, but at the same time, people love Yosemite because it's Yosemite. People love college football because it's college football and not the NFL, the NBA, or anything like that. So let me know your thoughts on that. I think it's an interesting idea. I appreciate the desire to adapt and, and to be mobile, nimble, but overall, keep college football college football so get at me in the live chat let me know how you feel about that <coughs> it makes me sick it makes me sick even talking about it let me know what you think about that though i'm excited to get nick Brake's thoughts here in just a matter of minutes a little bit later on in the show and uh hear what he thinks about the promotion relegation model okay the transfer portal opening up here in just a matter of days what can you expect first off and second of all what are some things that we think are going to happen from a team level a lot of teams are going to make some moves. Fully expect that your usual suspects will be there. I'm talking Florida. I'm talking Miami. I'm talking Ole Miss. I'm talking Colorado. Like I, I'm, I'm assuming they're going to go to work and use the portal how they have. But when it comes to how we're talking about the transfer portal right now in this post-spring window, there is a headline that is continuing to be thrown out there that, hey, it's going to be madness. It's going to be crazy. And I don't think that's untrue. I think that the portal will be a good bit crazy. I think there will be a pretty high volume of guys that jump in there post-spring. But I think the thing that's being sold to us as the college football public that I don't agree with and I don't think is being agreed upon across you know, different circles in the college football landscape right now behind closed doors is that you're going to see these first-round draft pick kind of guys, these All-American kind of guys, Heisman candidate kind of guys, declare for the NFL – or not declare for the NFL draft. I mean, I guess you potentially would have seen that, you know, Previously, uh, I digress. The bottom line here is there are some folks that are going to tell you, hey, the, uh, the transfer portal is going to take your very best players. I'm not saying that's not true, but I'm saying for the most part, the true madness within the transfer portal 
is happening right now behind closed doors. Like if you're a Heisman level candidate for the for the the college football season that's upcoming, you're probably already finding out what you're worth leading into this spring practice period. You're finding you know already what you'd be worth somewhere else before even going into the transfer portal. Because one thing that I think is a myth that we've sort of been, been told a couple of times here is that players are going to test out the transfer portal. They're going to go give it the old college try, jump in there, it's free market, we'll see what we're worth. Some players may do that, but I'm telling you, the top tier guys, the guys that you keep being told about, your starting quarterback, your starting wide receiver, the guy that's got a first-round draft grade for next year, they're, they already know what they're worth because they talked to their trainer who talked to a coach somewhere else who told them we got this much for you. And they probably said, okay, you got that much for me somewhere else. Thank you. I'm going to take that to the collective. I'm going to take that to somebody else, and I'm going to make sure I get my dollar amount. If somebody of a high-profile status jumps in the portal post-spring, they're not testing it out. One, they're in there for real. And two, they probably already know where they're going. So madness, yes, absolutely. But this idea that you're going to see Heisman Trophy winners jump in the portal, I don't think that's true. I don't think you'll see that. You definitely won't see that in the case where they're trying to put the collective and the staff between a rock and a hard place and leverage that. don't think that's reality. So when it comes to some predictions we have for the transfer portal, some teams that I think are uh, making a move or not making a move. Michigan is the school that I think is going to get the most buzz as soon as this transfer portal opens up because we have a very real question mark around who they have at quarterback. Michigan doesn't bring back a lot of returning production, but they still have a lot of pieces. Now, the assumption right now, if you were to put down money in Vegas, the betting favorite would probably be Alex Orgy. The reason why I think Michigan is going to go to the transfer portal for a quarterback is because I think right now, you have some good options in-house. I think when it comes to this portal opening up, I think there will be some great options that are available. And that's not me pointing the finger any specific place across the country, but I do think there's a lot of quarterback battles that will happen during the spring, and there'll be some high-profile guys that will be an upgrade for Michigan. And the reason why Michigan would go after an upgrade is because of who they have on the roster. Because I just told you, a lot of returning production, not coming back. That's absolutely true. But at the exact same time, there's a lot of key pieces that if you have the right quarterback to kind of make that whole meal mixed together correctly, you can make another run at this thing. You could make another go at a Big Ten title and have a chance to go make another college football playoff run and have confetti drop on you yet again. Colston Loveland, he's back. Defensively, you got some freak shows in Kenneth Grant. You got Will Johnson. Like a lot of dudes on that side of the football to ultimately give Michigan a really good chance to do some exciting things in 2024. Now, what's going to happen in terms of who they go after? Anybody's guess, but I personally believe that they'll go after somebody when it comes to that spring portal window. Uh, speaking of uh, contenders from a season ago, Michigan beat Alabama to get to the national title game in the Rose Bowl. I think Alabama goes into attack mode in this post-spring window. And it's a pretty broad way to say it, but the portal did what the portal did to Alabama post-spring, or, or post-season rather, some of it having to do with Nick Saban retiring, some of it having to do with just guys looking for other places to play. But I think when you look at Alabama and the way that they weren't able to retool their roster before spring has a lot to do with who they were able to pick from. Because when Nick Saban retired, that was after the Rose Bowl. I mean, that, that was after the national championship game. Pretty much everyone who jumped into the portal during Portal Monday for that first window, the high-profile guys, they, they, they already knew where they were going. They had already made their arrangements. They already committed, like, the creme de la creme, the guys that Alabama would draw from that could play for them, they already found a spot. And so when the tide goes out, it's eventually going to come back in for this second spring window, or this second portal window, rather. Alabama, I think, will be aggressive on the defensive side of the ball when it comes to maybe addressing some needs in the secondary. Could see Alabama being aggressive when it comes to acquiring some weapons. A lot of people want to play in Kalen DeBoer's offense. Here's the other thing I want to say, too. Nick Saban's not running the show out there anymore. That's the obvious part. But Alabama's still Alabama. Like, like let's, let's not confuse ourselves and pretend like Alabama was only Alabama because Nick Saban was there. Now, Nick Saban's the greatest of all time. There's no way to downplay that, okay? He made them, in a lot of ways, the team that they were over the course of the last two decades, more or less. So that's true. But that logo still got some real juice to it. Other thing, that fan base... I think there's some NIL pockets that are deeper than a lot of folks would like to believe. That care factor within that fan base, 
They're going to make sure those funds go to the right places, to the right players, to bring in the right talent. So when you talk about Alabama long-term, man, I think they're going to be a player this uh, second spring window, and I fully expect them to go ahead and, and pile up on some talent to replenish that roster in some places where they think they can, uh, they can address it, which hasn't always been Alabama style now. Remember, Nick Saban was more surgical in the portal. Quite frankly, because he had so much talent in-house they had developed, I think you'll see Alabama go attack mode. I would not be surprised, and this is not a prediction per se, but I would not be surprised if Alabama added somewhere in the range of double-digit guys when it was all said and done. Let's say in the state of Alabama, though, we got a chance to go out to Auburn, Alabama this past week, and it was phenomenal. Awesome facility. Great talking to Coach Hugh Freeze. Got to watch practice. There's a lot made about that quarterback room. And Peyton Thorne, the way he underachieved last year, had multiple games where he threw for under 100 yards. There's no way around that. It was a bad deal. But I think there's, when, it, when you look to this upcoming season, I think there's a, a little bit more confidence in Auburn around Peyton Thorne in-house than maybe there is nationally. I think for, for my portal prediction for Auburn, I don't think they go after a quarterback. I think Peyton Thorne is their guy when they start the season. I think he's their starting quarterback for a couple of reasons. One, what I just mentioned, there's some quiet confidence around him and what he did last year in flashes. The game against Alabama, the game against Georgia, took him down to the last drive against Georgia. He wasn't on the field fourth and 31. I mean, if you want to call a spade a spade, Peyton Thorne in a lot of ways did enough to beat Alabama. Now, there were some other games that were probably, you know, a little bit of, uh, of a blemish on that past season for Peyton Thorne. But again, he did not get spring practice a year ago. The most fundamental, foundational practices to your season – your quarterback was not able to get those. So you fast forward the tape. Now you get your development practices. You're 15 to kind of get your feet underneath you. And you add Hugh Freeze to run the offense for you. That's massive. That's massive. There's a feeling like, hey, when, when Hugh Freeze was calling the offense for us a year ago against Georgia, against you know the, those crucial spots in our season, the offense had a different rhythm to it. And so Hugh Freeze and his quarterback whisper prowess that, he, that he's got to him and Peyton Thorne being able to now develop a little bit better. I think that's going to make for a better result. Also, I think they have some more weapons around him. Cam Coleman, you know how we feel about him if you've watched this show for any length of time. I think he's going to be a dude. It's also worth noting, I think Auburn probably feels a little bit like, hey, we tried that last year. We tried the post-spring quarterback ad last year, and guess what? Didn't really work. Didn't work. It's, it's not the way to go long-term. It's not. Two in the hand versus – or. One in the hand versus two in the bush. We'll take the one in the hand. We got our guy Peyton Thorne. We're going to roll with him. And uh, if they had gotten somebody via the portal, it would have been pre-spring. Saw their name pop up with guys like Cam Ward, Caden Salter from Liberty. When he was in the portal for a hot minute, that made some sense. But I think they've chosen their path. They're committed to Peyton Thorne. And I'm excited to see what happens. <laughs> LSU, I think they refill the defensive line. I think that we see them kind of restock the trenches. Um, Makai Wingo, obviously a stud for them. He's gone. Mason Smith, he's gone. Brian Kelly understands what it takes to win in the SEC. And that's not me just saying that. I understand he's been there for two years, but guess what? He's got two double-digit win seasons, one of which he beat Alabama and made it to Atlanta for the SEC title game. So, like, guy knows how to coach football. Guy knows how to win football games. He understands it starts with those big boys up front. There's a reason why they got a new defensive staff, not defensive coordinator, defensive staff from what happened a season ago. I think Blake Baker is going to attract a lot of top talent. I think his defense is probably really fun to play in with how aggressive they like to be, kind of be the hammer, not the nail. LSU and that, uh, that care factor they have in-house as well. I think there's going to be a lot of guys that will see an opportunity at LSU on the defensive line, say, yeah, you know what, maybe, uh, maybe I do want to go to Baton Rouge and play for a, a logo like that at a place like that. And uh, I have to imagine there's the, there's the resources in place for them to attract and add top talent. So, it's going to be madness, no denying that, but will it be the same kind of madness that we're being sold it's going to be? I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it, but those are the teams that I think will uh, make some moves or not make some moves, and the bottom line here is we get to watch it all unfold here. It's a matter of days. should be a lot of fun. Good deal. Everyone tuned in live, would appreciate it. If you could like the video for us, that would be phenomenal. Got a lot of good stuff to get to here. We still have our most interesting team in the college football here. We got our top defenses here to get to. Before we do that, though, I want to go to a segment we've done here over the course of really the last, last few weeks, and that is unpopular takes that you strongly believe in when it comes to the college football landscape. Jody hit us up in 
They say Miami will be a top 10 team this upcoming season. My assumption is we're just saying Miami touches the top 10 at any point during the year. Maybe to you know put a finer point on it, they're saying that Miami's a top 10 team at the end of the season. I don't know, but however you slice it, this is not a crazy thing to say. It's not. And I think the thing that needs to be addressed ahead of this segment is there's going to be a lot of people that will have a comment on this unpopular take. There's a reason why, you know, they feel like it's unpopular as they submit it because there's a lot of people that will talk about college football walking backwards, like walking into the future with their back face to it. They just want to talk about what happened previously with no gauge, of course, for the idea of improvement and potential and what could happen they just want to talk about oh we hear this all the time with Miami oh well they never do this they never do that notice those same people will be very quick to point to the game where Miami should have taken a knee against Georgia Tech they didn't they lost the game and one decision in their mind defines Mario Cristobal and defines Miami as a team beware of those people especially the narrative where they say they always say this you're going to hear a lot of that Miami I hear this every single off season they're always going to do something they're always about to do something I think there's a portion of that where you say, yeah, there is usually some buzz around Miami. But I think the reason for that being the offseason is for optimism. You know what I'm saying? Like the offseason is for a time to think that your team can do something. we got several months here to talk about it. Might as well have an optimistic spin on it if you're a fan. But with that being said, there's optimism paired with the fact that Miami's a massive fan base. Like that's, that's a song that pretty much every fan base is playing across the country is, hey, our team could maybe do something this year. The difference is Miami just has that blasted the loudest because of how many people they have and how big that speaker is with how large their fan base is. So you're going to hear that, but I'm telling you, man, I really, I've said this a couple times, I really get Texas vibes from Miami. Texas vibes from a season ago. Same narrative. Well, you always hear this about Texas. Ah, I can't believe Texas is saying this again. And then what happens? Texas puts it together in their third year under a proven commodity as a coach with a returning talented quarterback, and they go win the conference and make the college football playoff. Now, obviously, if Miami does that, they check that box of being a top 10 team. But the reason why I think this is very possible is because Miami's schedule in a lot of ways is going to allow for that to be a possibility. Game one, you're at Florida. Again, that's kind of got a little bit of a what the heck is about to happen feel to it because it's in the swamp. If it was a neutral site, I probably would say Miami's favored by four and a half plus after that though they should have the roster advantage in every single game until they get to October 19th at Louisville the the beautiful part about this here they get a bye right before they go to Louisville now the game against Virginia Tech if it was in Blacksburg maybe you feel a little bit more uneasy about it but I'm telling you man the roster should be better than Florida A&M Ball State at USF even Virginia Tech with all the production they bring back they got to go to Cal but I'm telling you that bye right before the game at Louisville should serve them well. And the tough stretch there is that two-game stretch at Louisville, then right into Florida State. Beautiful part about it, though, you get to play Florida State at the crib. Now, a lot of, a lot of the naysayers going to let yell and say, hey, well, is Hard Rock really a home field advantage? One, if they're playing well, I think you'll see a little bit more of a home field advantage. The second part of it is you'd much rather play that game at Hard Rock than you would in Tallahassee because there is a very real home field advantage in Tallahassee. So you kind of walk that thing out, okay, so – Florida State, Louisville, there's no Clemson on the schedule. There's a lot of question marks across the schedule, period, if you're the ACC. Like, it's kind of a question mark for most teams in that conference. If they go and split Florida State and Louisville, and they win the game they're supposed to win from a roster perspective, 11-1, and one, you're a top-10 team. 10-2, and two, you're probably in the, in the conversation, maybe even – in the top 10 as a top 10 team, making the college football playoff. So a lot of ifs there, a lot of potentials, but that's what we're talking about right now. Can they do it? I think they can. And I think when you talk about Miami and their ability to do something like that this upcoming season, the the conversation you used to have around Miami is, well, just, I don't know if they got the dudes right now to do it. I don't know if they got the guys. I don't think that's the case at Miami. Now, do they have the best roster in the ACC? Are they just going to walk out there and light it up every single game? I think that's a little bit more of a question mark. I understand that. But when you talk about Miami this upcoming season, they are, in my opinion, at least within striking distance. Like, that, they, if, if they have the best roster or not, whole different discussion. But I think they have a good enough roster to be in and, quite frankly, win every single game that they have on their schedule. Will they do it? Comes down to coaching, comes down to execution. 
and a myriad of other factors that go into a college football game, which is why we love this sport and why we tune in every single Saturday. But if this happens, a couple of things this means. If Miami's a top 10 team, it means Mario Cristobal is as advertised when he got to the U. Because when he got there, there were two things that I think you could distill down Coach Cristobal to. Culture, talent acquisition. Get the bricks, got the mortar to make it all work together. So far, Miami, two top 10 classes since he's been there. Miami also attacking the portal. Adding the guy like Cam Ward. So Mario Cristobal, as advertised, that's the first thing that you'd be able to say. The second part of this is it means that Cam Ward elevated this team to more than likely ACC title level. At the very minimal ACC title contention, but I think they'd be an ACC championship kind of team. When I say that, from a numbers perspective, Miami scored 30 points a game in 2023. The last couple of seasons, the numbers tell us that you've got to probably score in the range of around 35 points a game to win the conference. It's what Clemson was in the range of doing in 2022. It's what, uh, what Florida State did in 2023. So Cam Ward making you right around a touchdown better as an offense, I think that's very possible. But when it comes to the Saturday in and Saturday out perspective of this whole conversation around Miami and Cam Ward and what they could do, it goes to Cam Ward, I think multiple times during this season, being the difference maker. And that sounds like a simplistic statement. I mean like, hey, it's a tied game. Maybe it's the first game of the season in the swamp. It's fourth quarter. You've got to have this third down. Florida has a blitz dialed up to get to him. Makes a move up in the pocket, uses the mobility. His experience allows him a little bit of presence to keep his eyes downfield, finds the check down, first down, keep it moving, hit a, hit a field goal to win the whole game. Like Plays like that, the it factor Cam Ward provides, I don't know they've had that in some time. I suppose Tyler Van Dyke in his first year as the guy in Coral Gables you could make an argument for, but I really think Cam Ward just brings a whole new element of what he can do as your starting quarterback out there. I'm excited to see it. I'm excited to see it, and I think if they go out and be a top-10 team in 2024, you'd be able to say that with absolute certainty. Now, here's the last thing we got to talk about. If this happens, the ripple effect in recruiting that Miami will see, it's going to be a tidal wave now. Because they're already acquiring talent at an elite level. Some of that's their care factor. Some of that's resources. Have to believe a lot of that's Mario Cristobal and his staff just being absolute dogs in the recruiting trail and prioritizing recruiting. But they're adding talent right now. What has Miami really done since Cristobal's got there? 5-7 and seven and 7-5? Seven and, and you're still adding top 10 classes? What happens when they start winning? I've said it a few times about Miami, but what happens if they start winning? They are in the talent hotbed of the United States when it comes to high school recruits. There's a lot of guys that are looking to stay home, that are looking to be just down the street from where mom is, where their high school classmates are. Like They're looking to stay in the area. I truly believe that. Having a reason to do that and go play football at the highest level and wear that logo that they've seen be successful at different points throughout their childhood and at the very least probably seen the 30 for 30 of what Miami has been historically, there's some juice there. A lot of untapped potential, but a top 10 season in 2024 is one, attainable, and two, would be a powder keg for talent acquisition and would put the rest of the state on notice. So should be a lot of fun, but Miami, can they be a top 10 team? Jody, I don't think that that unpopular take deserves the smoke that you may or may not be getting in your respective group chat. But we appreciate you bringing it to the table. Appreciate you bringing it to us here on the show. Miami's a massively, massively interesting team this upcoming season. Like, they're one of those teams that I would love to go out and get to see at some point during the spring if we can make it happen. But during the fall, man, Hard Rock, Coral Gables. I understand that Hard Rock isn't in Coral Gables, but you hear what I'm saying. I'd love to go see Miami play in person. I think this could be a really fun year for the folks out there. Like I said, interesting team is Miami. Speaking of interesting, uh, interesting teams, who are the most interesting teams – in college football. Now, Nick Brake put this lower third together, and it's absolute money. It's the Dosakis guy. I don't think we have rights to the song. Otherwise, we would play that in the background. But who are the most interesting teams in college football? Let's talk about it right now. I think USC, for me, top of that list when it comes to intrigue for a couple of reasons. Y'all, we got a quarterback battle going on out there in L.A. A little Miller Moss action. Heis Miller, from what he was doing out there in that holiday bowl, he's just throwing darts like it was his job and I guess it was that day playing in relief of Caleb Williams and then you bring in Jaden Maiava from UNLV now if you remember correctly Jaden Maiava hits the portal 
really talented season, a really talented quarterback, great season at UNLV, commits to Georgia originally. There's the old switcheroo. You know what? Lincoln Riley wants me to play quarterback for him at some point in time. I'm going to go with the quarterback whisper. So now you've got these guys getting after it behind closed doors. We talked to some folks over at WeRSC yesterday, and what I was told is the winner of the quarterback battle is USC. Like Either, either way, whether it's Miller Moss or Jaden Maiava, USC is winning that quarterback battle. So it doesn't sound like a, a tremendous drop-off for Lincoln Riley when it comes to developing elite quarterbacks. This defense, man, say what you want. It's, it's a brand-new defensive staff. Brand-new defensive staff. Danton Lynn, Eric Henderson, some real skins on the wall for those guys. I keep saying it now. You cannot overstate the juice that a new staff can bring to that kind of room. Just new energy, new philosophies, new vibe. It's massive. Absolutely massive. So what I will say is, when it comes to USC in 2024, moving into the Big Ten. So the emphasis on them having a solid defense, it's, it's, I mean, it was already important before in the Pac-12, but you are going to get real deal exposed if you don't bring those big boys up front and you don't stop the run, play sound football. Just kind of the fact of the matter. So for USC, the over-under win total for them is 7.5. If USC has a college football playoff level offense, how good can they be in the Big Ten? College football playoff level offense and the defense just a little bit better. They can hold serve against teams like, you know, the, the Ohio States of the world, the Michigans, the Penn States. Just saying, could be a good deal. Now, they'll have a great test that first game of the season against LSU in Las Vegas. Excited to watch that. But I'm just saying, now you only get to make a first impression once in the Big Ten. Where does USC fall in the pecking order? Texas A&M. Also, massively interesting team. Vegas has them at a, an over-under of eight and a half wins. I think Vegas is just telling you, like, hey, we don't know what to do with them. Because the, the thing with A&M is it's never been really a matter of roster talent. It hasn't. It really hasn't. For me, it's always been a matter of structure, execution, putting the right pieces of the puzzle where they're supposed to go. And God bless Jimbo Fisher, they weren't able to do it. Now you bring in someone like a Mike Elko, who quite frankly has done more with less with his time at Duke, I think there's a massive disruption opportunity for the folks at A&M. They play four college football playoff contenders during this season. And the funny part about this for A&M now, the guys that they bring back, their top 20 in returning production, bring back their quarterback who really, I mean, we haven't really seen him play a full season just yet, but we've seen him in flashes do some really exciting things in Connor Wegman. There's no college football playoff buzz around A&M right now. But I don't think we should ignore the fact that this definitely could be the year with the talent they have, the structure they could have. Just saying a and could be a force this year. Very, very interesting to see what they do. Definitely one of the most interesting teams in the college football world. Oklahoma. Again, Vegas telling us no idea what to do with this team. Over under is seven and a half wins for them, which you see the Oklahoma logo, a team that you've been accustomed to competing for a Big 12 title year in and year out during the Lincoln Riley and Coach Stoops days. Really strong year, too, for Brent Venables as they move into the SEC. Had a tough year the first year, kind of get your footing, first time being a head coach. Second year, double-digit win seasons. Okay, now we go. Now we go. You bring back 79% of the production on defense from a year ago, which is massive. Brand-new quarterback. Brand-new quarterback in Jackson Arnold. And the thing about Oklahoma, I really think the defense is going to be okay. Like, I think the defense is going to be more than fine to hold up their end of the bargain in the SEC. And I know that's kind of the punchline for a lot of folks is, I'll get ready for those SEC trenches. Get ready for those big boys up front, man. They're going to take you all to the woodshed. See, I don't, I don't think that's going to happen to Oklahoma. I really don't. But I think when you talk about Oklahoma and whatever your prediction is for them when it comes to succeeding or failing in 2024, it is directly tied to Jackson Arnold. As he goes, they will go. Now, do they have the weapons to allow him to have success that he needs to have? Remains to be seen, but a lot of it obviously is going to fall on the new starter for Oklahoma at quarterback. Big thing with, with uh, Oklahoma as well in 2024. We said it about USC. I'm going to say it about Oklahoma. You only get to make a first impression once. This is your first chance to do it. And when I say first impression, I'm talking about recruits, right? Because Oklahoma internally... The rest of the, the SEC, like, nobody's going to look over Oklahoma over the course of the next three years and say, ah, easy dub. Oklahoma's always going to be Oklahoma, and I, I truly believe Brett Menables is a good football coach. But when it comes to making a first impression for recruits, 
You get to tell kids, hey, when we go to the SEC, this is who we're going to be. You finished seventh in the SEC. Oh, boy, hey, I, I might look a little bit closer at Texas, Texas A&M, and the schools that you're competing against to try to land these guys. But you land, you know, top three in the SEC, top four in the SEC your first year in the conference. Say, hey, it's only year three for Brent Venables. Look at the direction this thing is trending. First year in the best conference in America, and we're top three, top four. We need you to come be a part of it. Help us reach the pinnacle here. So the first impression cannot be more important than it is right now for Oklahoma as they move into the SEC when it comes to acquiring talent. Last team with massive, massive intrigue, if you ask me, Clemson Tigers. Now, this is one win total that I have said a couple of times. I think it's a little bit rich for my liking. Their over-under is at nine and a half wins. But the ACC, to be fair, is a walking question mark. It's a walking question mark. I don't know what Florida State's going to be. Their 83rd returning production. They've been great with the portal historically, but, like, can they do it again? Can they pull the rabbit out of the hat again or rabbit out of the portal yet again? Miami, we'll see. The thing with me with Clemson is they return their quarterback that's kind of a, a more of a rare thing when you look across the ACC for those teams that we expect to be, you know, contenders for that conference. Florida State, new quarterback. Miami, really good, but new quarterback. Uh, Louisville, new quarterback. NC State, new quarterback. ACC, uh, Clemson brings back Kate Klubnick for another go around with Garrett Riley. Can we circle the wagons? Can we circle the wagons, Dabo, and get the boys going and find a way to get over that nine and a half win mark and compete for an ACC title yet again. Because they won the thing in 2022, but the way that last year went, I think optically kind of ruffled some feathers and was below their standard they've come to expect out there. For the record, the standard that Dabo Sweeney has set out there. Another eight win season is going to make it feel like, I don't know if this is the case, but this is the way it's going to feel is that Dabo Sweeney's way of doing things doesn't work. Is that fair? I don't know, but that's how it would feel if they won eight games yet again. To me, it all hinges on this offense being able to create explosives. Because that Clemson defense last year, one of the better defenses in the country, in my opinion, definitely one of the better defenses in the ACC. But you look at what they did offensively. You see the points per game total, 26 points per game. Probably got to be 9 to 10 points better to compete for the conference title. Again, based on what we've seen throughout the course of that conference the last couple of seasons. Numbers show you got to probably score 35 a game. Six yards a pass for Clemson last year. Six yards. Y'all, it's good for 121st in America. There's only 134 teams. You cannot play conference competing football, college football playoff competing football, averaging six yards a pass. Can't do it. Some of that's personnel. Some of that's on Kate Klubnick. Some of that's on the strategy, the scheme. But like as a whole, they need to create more explosives. And I think they got some guys in that receiver room that are poised to step up and do so, including some young bucks. So we'll see what happens there, but just keep an eye on the explosives for Clemson. That's going to correlate directly, in my opinion, to their aspirations to competing for an ACC championship. So a lot of interesting teams here. We've got USC, A&M, Oklahoma, Clemson. A lot of intrigue, a lot of interesting teams with some very massive question marks and some very big opportunities, quite frankly, in front of them especially USC and Oklahoma as they move into their different uh, respective conferences. Hey, good crowd. We appreciate y'all that are dialed in. Again, make sure you like the video. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, and we're going to keep a good thing going. We appreciate y'all making college football a year-round ordeal as we do on this show, because quite frankly, it is. Who are the most dangerous defenses in 2024? Gave some love to the offense already, so if you want to check out that video, it's already on this channel. But, hey, we understand that. What's the old saying? Now defense wins championships? Well, Nebraska got a really good defense they're building out there in Lincoln. And a lot made about how they haven't made a bowl game in what feels like forever. And I understand that. But they bring back 78% of their production from Tony White's defense last year. And, oh, by the way, you bring back Tony White. That dude's going to be a head coach probably this time next year is my expectation. But, hey, one more go around for the boys. They allowed 18 points a game. I also think it's worth noting the way that they operate schematically, that 3-3-5 defense, is going to be something that serves them really well with some of the new entries into the Big Ten. Because 3-3-5 now, you saw it last year, they are built to fly around. See ball, get ball, read your keys, be instinctual, go knock somebody's block off. They did that really effectively last year. And they got a lot of the guys 
back from that defense that did that at a high level last year. So Nebraska more than likely going to be breaking in, in my opinion, a freshman quarterback in Dylan Raiola. If you can support him and hold it down, you're going bowling. Okay, you're going to be going bowling. A lot of that hinges on Dylan Raiola making good decisions. But I think he's an upgrade, and I think the defense getting even better than they were last year. Massive for Nebraska. Very, very, uh, very sneakily, we can say. It's sneakily a word. Very, very quietly one of the best defenses, I believe, in college football. Let's stay in the Big Ten. Ohio State, man. Ohio State, whether it was in a literal sense or a, meta- or a, a metaphorical sense, sat down with the defense. He had JT Tui Malawau, Jack Sawyer, Denzel Burke. At some point in time, probably texted each other and said, hey, let's run it back. And that's exactly what they did. They got a defense that was top five last year in the country, running it back. And then, oh, by the way, you bring in the best player, not the best defensive player, not the best safety, the best player, period, in Caleb Downs from the transfer portal. That was massive. It's going to be massive. I also think it's worth noting here, the strides they took from year one to year two in Jim Knowles' defense, people talk about going from knowing what to do to being able to instinctually execute what to do. It can just be kind of come second nature. It's like riding a bike. They made that step from year one to year two. With all these guys back for another year now, and how smart of a football player Caleb Downs is going into year three of this system, I think you're going to see them build on what they did last season from a schematic standpoint. You could see some more exotic blitzes. You could see them be a little bit more confusing. And uh, with the way the Big Ten is upping the ante and the way that they play Oregon, I believe it's in Eugene actually in October. It's going to be a fun one to watch because you better bring your hard hat and lunch pail when you play that offense. Ohio State will be ready with how they're operating defensively. Definitely one of the most dangerous defenses in the country. Now, we spoke about Oregon a moment ago. I think you can put them in term, uh, right in that group of one of the most dangerous defenses heading up this season. They have another year with a lot of the guys from last year's defense. 70% of the production from last season that allowed 17 points a game is back. Mateo Uyunglele, uh, Jordan Birch, dude who you know, will get after you consistently. They also add in a corner from Washington via the portal in Jabbar Muhammad. Okay, now he was a guy that actually played on the opposite side of the field against Oregon last year when he was at Washington, and he was locked down. The reason why it's so important you add a corner like him that you can leave on the island and feel pretty good about the way he's going to operate is because that allows your defense to cut it loose a little bit more up front. You don't have to worry about the back end and, oh, do we have coverage on the back end? Are we going to have a guy that can hold it down on the back end? You do. So you can feel a little more confident if you're Tosh LaPoy, dialing up those defenses, getting after those guys. Yes, sir. That's not good. Okay. Full page frozen. Well, there we go. Well, hey, let's keep on. Hey, we just keep on going, baby. That's how it is. That's how it is. We control. We control attitude. We control effort. We don't control technology. Well, hey, let's let's keep rolling here, Nick. Do we do we have uh do we have video feed to post this as a one off later? Is that a, is that a reality for us? No, we don't. Okay, well, let's ride. Let's ride out. Can so they can they hear our voices? Okay, well. Audio is fine. Okay. No, you're good. I saw the monitor go dark, and I was like, "Hmm, I wonder if I shouldn't do that." Well, hey, well, you know what? Let's let's do this. Since we have uh, that was going to be our last segment anyway. If you're watching on YouTube, we'll re-record this. We'll put it out as a one-off video. If you want to hear the rest of that. Uh, want to hear the rest of that um, segment. You know what we should do, though? Let's, let's involve the live chat. Let's go for a few questions in the live chat, and let's figure this thing out. What do you say? Because podcasts were, were chill, right? Podcasts were chill. Dang, podcast. Shouts to y'all for being dialed in, man. Shouts to y'all for being dialed in. So the, the reason why we're stopping, if you're on podcast, for some reason, lost video feed. And so we just, we just make it. We, hey, we just ad lib, baby. Like Johnny Manziel, we just get out of a tackle and make it happen. Um, all right, well, let's go. Let's, let's talk a little about the live chat. What are, uh, you know, while you're working on that, I'm just going to go to the live chat, get a few questions, 
And uh, I see a lot of Miami hurricane love in here, brother. You know what? I'll, just, I'll go solo because nobody can even see me. So I'll just sort of uh, run the chat here. All right, so if you're dialed in right now live, we appreciate y'all. Hey, like the video, subscribe to the channel, all that good stuff. Um, let's get in your questions right now because I'm literally going through our live chat and just just seeing what y'all are saying here. A lot of folks saying uh, how you saw this whole thing go off the air. We appreciate y'all for sticking with us, man. Good stuff. I think I can fix it. You guys can still listen. Yeah, we're good, brother. We're good. Someone says Cam Ward will be a Heisman candidate. Watch. I see. I, I don't think that's a wild thing to say by any stretch of the imagination with how good that defense can be. Or not with how good that defense can be, with how good that offense can be with him running the show. You know what? Let's just let's just get off the air here and we'll uh We'll circle back up. But, hey, we appreciate y'all that have been dialed in throughout the course of the show. We appreciate y'all rolling with us here. A little bit, of, little bit of excitement here on our end. But regardless, man, we appreciate y'all being dialed in. Appreciate y'all being a part of the show. And um, with that being said, we'll be back on the air on Tuesday, headed to a campus as well in the near future. And, uh, yeah, we love y'all. We appreciate y'all. We're going to keep this party rolling, and we will see y'all.